Ulaanbaatar during communist rule. Between 1924 and 1990, Mongolia was governed as a satellite state of the Soviet Union, part of the East Asian Communist Bloc. Generally on this channel, we've focused on Korea, the DPRK. But for two very good reasons, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Mongolian People's Republic. Firstly, it bears many similarities to the DPRK. And secondly, for the past two years, this is where I've been living, the Red Hero City, or Ulaanbaatar. In this video, I'll be looking at how the standoff between China and the USSR resulted in the militarization of Mongolia, air bases in the Gobi Desert, and a huge Red Army presence across the country, only for it all to come crashing down in the 1990s, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Mongolia has a lot of Soviet history to be told, so in this video we're only going to focus on one aspect, the role the country played in preventing a war between China and the Soviet Union. Mongolia has a long and contentious history as a buffer state separating the Russian Empire from the various dynasties of modern day China. Throughout its long history, the country has often been claimed as part of Chinese dynasties Russian territorial expansions and governed as an autonomous region under the control of foreign powers. The Bogd Khanate of Mongolia was ruled from here, the Winter Palace of the Bogd Khan, from 1911, after Mongolia established its autonomy from the rapidly failing Qing dynasty. However, by 1919, the Republic of China re-established its control over the country, under the guise of defending it from an unstable Russia in the throes of revolution to the north. With the victory of the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg and Moscow, the communist forces pushed further eastward, and an underground resistance in Mongolia began talks with the Soviet government to establish a new country under the command of the People's Revolutionary Party. At the same time, the remaining forces of Tsarist Russia advanced into Mongolia, forcing the Chinese military out and taking control of the capital. This wouldn't last long, however, as in July of 1921, Soviet forces met with Mongolian revolutionaries in Irkutsk, under the command of Damdin Sukhbatar, to retake the country, re-establish the Bogd Khan, and rename the capital Ulaanbaatar, or Red Hero City. This constitutional monarchy lasted until 1924, when, with the death of the ruling Bogd Khan, the Bogd Khanate was replaced by the People's Republic of Mongolia.
With the 1949 victory of the communist forces in China, relations warmed between Beijing and Ulaanbaatar. However, the geopolitical situation didn't change. For the Chinese and the Soviets, Mongolia continued to serve as a buffer state, albeit one under the increasing influence of Moscow. This would become vital for regional security in the decades to come. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the Soviet Union and China began to diverge politically. A breakdown in relations between these two communist powers meant Mongolia became a major part of the Sino-Soviet frontier. But to see the real impact of the militarization of the Mongol front, we have to head south into the vast expanse of the Gobi Desert. We are travelling 90 kilometres south of Ulaanbaatar to a small town built by the Soviets called Bagahangai, part of the land ceded to the Red Army to establish a protective front against the Chinese. So, a town like this is obviously Soviet built with the prefabricated apartment blocks and the streets which disappear out to essentially nothing. <laughs> but this town isn't famous for what's here in the centre. It's famous for what's just outside it. The Soviets were ceded large tracts of land near Ulaanbaatar, Choibalsan in the east and Sanshans near the Chinese border, where they built numerous air bases and military infrastructure. Here at Bagahangai, the Soviets built a 2.8 kilometer long runway to serve as part of a network of forward operating bases and defensive infrastructure to defend against potential Chinese military advances. These fighter bases served as a first line of defense against the Chinese who, should they advance through Mongolia, were expected to focus on this route through Sainshan and along this main road and rail route to Ulaanbaatar. By the time of the Soviet withdrawal in 1990, the USSR had over 130 aircraft, 190 helicopters and over 50,000 troops stationed in Mongolia. Unfortunately, despite the incredible investment made by Moscow into military infrastructure in Mongolia, during the 1990s it was all but abandoned, and nowhere is that clearer than our next stop.
We're now heading back up north, towards Ulaanbaatar, to an outskirt town that was once home to the 12th Motorized Rifle Division of the Soviet Armed Forces, and housed over 14,000 soldiers at the height of the deployment. This is Bagnor. Today, it's a small mining town, as is the case with a lot of these smaller Mongolian settlements. But originally, it was built as a military base for the Soviet army. As you'll see when we head into the town, it's hardly capable of housing a 15,000 strong motorized division. But there's a very good reason for that. So as we saw in Bagahangai, Bagnor is an obviously Soviet-built city, but immediately what you'll notice is it's nowhere near big enough to house a 15,000 strong army. That's because this city I'm standing in right now didn't. This did. This enormous military complex once housed the 12th Motorized Rifle Division, formed in 1960 and stationed in Mongolia from 1979. It's not especially obvious until you're here just how massive this place is. Built by the Russians to serve as a sort of home from home for the thousands of military personnel serving in Mongolia, even to the extent of importing Russian trees to give the place a more homely feel. Today, there's not much left of this base. Once a bustling centre for thousands of families, now we had to spend much of our time in the truck to avoid the packs of stray dogs which roam the wastelands. There are still a small number of Soviet-era apartment blocks on the edge of the base. How long they'll be here, we don't know. But for now, they give a fantastic insight into the lives of the families who lived here. Being a military station, once the order came through to withdraw, the troops at Bagnor essentially packed up and left. This military base made up part of the Ulaanbaatar command region and was home to the largest contingent of ground troops in the area. If you look at where we are now compared to the capital, 
Bagnor was home to the ground force contingent, whilst just up the road is Nalaik, which was the airbase home to the Joint Air Force Squadron and Special Aircraft Command. So overall, this area was very well protected. Well protected from invasion perhaps, but not so much from the collapse of the Soviet government. The early 1990s saw the Mongolian government collapse, followed shortly after by the USSR. As part of efforts to rebuild Sino-Soviet ties, the orders were given in 1986 to begin a withdrawal of Soviet troops from Mongolia, to be completed by 1992. Over the following years, preparations were made to return the troops aircraft and other hardware back to the Soviet Union. In the case of Bagnor, troops were recalled in 1990 and the base converted to a storage depot until 1993 when it was abandoned. And finally, you join me here in the Polygon, a massive area of open land designed for live fire training exercises. Unfortunately, since the 1990s, a lot of the original building material has been scavenged by locals, and not a lot of attention has been given to maintaining or preserving any of the original old Russian base. I'm standing in front of one of many MiG-21s scattered across Mongolia. It was these fighter jets that were a major part of the Soviet air defence during the 1960s through to the 1980s. Whilst Mongolia itself was never part of the Soviet Union, it was fully integrated into the nation's defence. Whilst small skirmishes occurred between the Russians and the Chinese during the Sino-Soviet split, the existence of Mongolia meant these never escalated into a full-scale war. And I think that's pretty cool. Thank you to everyone who's watched and enjoyed this slightly different style of video. I've hugely enjoyed making this short documentary and it's been a great excuse to travel around to check some of these places out. It would not have been possible without my patrons on Patreon, link in the description, but also, most of all, to my friend Rich, who runs Absolute Nomads, a travel company based in Mongolia, which I've been working with over the last few years. If you want to check out these places for yourself, we'll be running a Soviet Mongolia tour every May and October, visiting Bagnor, Bagahangai, and a plethora of other interesting sites where the Soviet legacy lives on. So, if you're interested, the details will be in the description. And again, Thanks for watching.